All right, we're going to get started. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Representative Rena Moran. I represent District 65A in St. Paul. And I just want to thank you all for being here today um, to be a part of what is we call as a call to action on something that is really, really important, that's really impacting black families uh, and our black children. And so thank you for this time and for this moment. So after the tragic death of Eric Dean in 2013, at the abusive hands of his stepmother, the Star Tribune began a series of groundbreaking reports in 2014 that exposed the failure of our child protection system charged with protecting our youngest Minnesotans. Mm -hmm. And before I go any further, um, I, I think it's important to say that we're here today because the well-being and safety of all children is really important to us. But even more importantly, we know that the safety and well-being of African-American children and families are important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And today we're here to highlight why we need a bill that really protects children of African-American descent um, from being separated at high numbers mm -hmm. from their parents. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, out of that series of reports from the Star Tribune, it changed how we reported child abuse reporting in Minnesota. It changed how we fund county child protection efforts, and it is changing how we respond to the continued backlog of child protection reports in the state. <coughs> Governor Dayton created the Governor Dayton created a governor task force on the protection of children in 2014 after those reports. In the last budget we passed, legislators made it clear that protecting children and providing a safe home for children to learn and grow and feel love is something that we are all committed to at any cost. But the investment has not been there. Mm -hmm. The Governor Task Force on the Protection of Children also made it clear that our child protection professionals may not be approaching every child in this state equally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The report highlights the continued disproportionate, disproportional overrepresentation of children by race and ethnicity. Yes. Mm -hmm. For years, black families in Minnesota have expressed frustration mm -hmm. that county staff we're not treating them equally. Yes. Since at least 2013, we've had clear evidence, and probably even further than that, mm -hmm. but we've had clear evidence from the Minnesota Child Welfare Report and other sources that it is mathematically the case. Yes. When compared to Caucasian children, African American children experience a higher rate of involvement in child protection services and out of home placement. Mm -hmm. The final 2015 Governor Task Force report stated, it stated the, the problem clearly. And I quote from page 19 and 20, to safely reduce racial disproportionality requires a multi-pronged strategic effort which must reach far beyond human services. Yes. In order to further this work, however, However, we need to establish better connections with racial, ethnic, and tribal communities mm -hmm. to fund and examine research into promising practices to reduce disparities and to change public systems to implement a culturally responsive service array within the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. Racial disparities in the child welfare system must be viewed as a call to action mm -hmm. from all of us. Mm -hmm. regardless of race, to come together to better understand the cause of the disparities yeah. and to work together to identify institutional resources yeah. and practices that can be adopted that would generally improve the lives of children. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say in families. Mm -hmm. House File 3973 does just that. It puts the well-being of African-American children at the forefront with an array of multi-pronged strategic efforts 
holistic approaches that strengthen families, alleviate reoccurring trauma, and sets a good path for great outcomes. As a lawmaker, I have the power and the obligation to act when I see injustices, mm -hmm. unequal treatment, and a lack of equity in our government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The task force provides us, the task force, this bill, provides us with a set of actions on some of these racial disparities, injustices, and that's what led Senator Hayton and myself today, along with our allies, community members who bring those voices from the community into this body to bring solutions about how we can work to ensure that every child, every child, well-being is at the forefront of how we fund government right. and allocate services and create policies and legislation. That's right. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I would like to next introduce uh, Khalees Hulse. Houston. 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 Mm -hmm. Khalees Houston, who has worked tirelessly yes. mm -hmm. yes. as a garden at Lightham, mm -hmm. yes. crafting the language in this bill, and has direct insight into problems and solutions. Mm -hmm. So I give you Khalees. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Houston, if you could do us a favor, please give us your name. Yes, it's Khalees, K-E-L-I-S, last name Houston, just like the city, H-O-U-S-T-O-N. Uh, and while I do work as a guardian at Lightham, the work that I do in the community is most important to me. I am chair of the NAACP's Child Protection Committee mm -hmm. and founder of Village Arms, a Christ-centered nonprofit that is dedicated to aiding and assisting African-American youth and families impacted by child protection. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we started the committee, the reason that we are working tirelessly is because we've noticed a disturbing trend within child protection where African-American children are illegally removed from their homes. Mm -hmm. In face of the same or more egregious allegations, African-American children are being removed from fit parents and placed in non-relative care. When we have relatives that step forward and are supposed to be allowed the right to care for their relatives, they're being kept out from doing so. Mm -hmm. So we're working to address this issue on a multidimensional systemic level. So we're working on policy reform, legislation such as HF 3973, as well as uh, individual advocacy for families. What's even more disturbing is that we've noticed another trend where African-American children are being removed from fit foster parents as well, African-American foster parents mm -hmm. and relatives and placed in non-relative Caucasian homes. Mm -hmm. And with the, the recent media and um, the tragic deaths of those five children that were driven off of the cliff, it just shows the dire need that we have for reform. So mm -hmm. we're here today just really asking that you all support HF3973, contact your Republican, um, your Republican Party, um, your allies, uh, organizations, and um, just stress the need for it. We have some families here because I know data doesn't always do it. So we have some families here that have had uh, experiences that illustrate just what we're speaking of today. And I want to introduce Dwight Mitchell. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. My name is Dwight Mitchell, and I fully support this bill. Just as many other African American in Minnesota, I too was a victim of the child protective system when my children were illegally kidnapped from my custody. I was intentionally, maliciously, and sadistically denied all contact with my middle son for 22 months. Mm. It was 22 months of lost smiles, lost hugs, and lost time spent together as a family. After obtaining my case files, over 600 pages of information, I have official Dakota County documentation that will show CPS intentionally violated my consul constitutional rights by, one, illegally removing my children from the family home without a court order and exigent circumstances. They fabricated evidence to the court to illegally retain custody of my children. They failed to provide me with a safety plan to keep the family together prior to removal of my children as required by Minnesota state statutes. Mm -hmm. They failed to provide me with a written case plan to keep the family together 
or tell me what was required of me after my children were removed by Minnesota state statutes. They failed to provide me with a written reunification plan on how to even get my children returned to me as required by Minnesota state statute. But most important is in an effort to illegally terminate my parental rights, the social worker and guardian ad litem fabricated evidence to the court by stating I had abandoned my son in Minnesota, had made no efforts for reunification, and had not been in contact with them for five months, when in fact the exact opposite was true. On the day that they submitted this information to the court, I had had a conversation with the social worker. We had seven appointments with myself, my son, and the child psychologist, and that afternoon they went into court and told the judge this information. All of the above actions were reviewed and approved by Dakota County supervisors. Their signatures are on the documents. Mm -hmm. This disparate and unconstitutional and illegal treatment of African Americans in Minnesota by overzealous, inadequately trained, and inadequately supervised employees of an out of control government agency must stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next, I'm going to introduce Darshima Jones, who unfortunately lost custody of all five of her children, although it was found that she never abused any of them. Um, she's fighting right now for a reversal of that termination because after reviewing the case, we found that there were so many um, violations of state statute. Her two oldest children are still languishing in foster care, although she provided over four um, very fit relatives to provide care for those children. So we'll hear from Starshima. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Starshima Jones. Um, January 2011, my rights were terminated due to false allegations of neglect. Following the investigation, Hennepin County um, documented that f all five of my children were not in any imminent danger, but yet they were removed from my home. Um, there was no talk of a safety plan, no mention of a case plan, and no intention of a reunification. Hennepin County has fabricated num num numerous documents in regards to myself and my children. At the time, I could not afford an attorney, so I was appointed a public defender um, and didn't have time to sort through the details, which was another convenience for, for Hennepin County. I did everything that they asked me to do. I never missed a court date. I went to see a therapist and was never diagnosed with any mental health or any behavioral disorders. The law says that the family should be considered for kinship. My mother, my sister, and my cousin all went and got licensed and were offered other children of a different race and were never offered the opportunity to get their own relatives. It's now 2018, seven years later, and my two oldest children are 16 and 14 and still up for adoption in two different states outside of Minnesota. The family reunification law that passed in 2013 from Mark Dayton says that the county attorney has to petition the court in order to um, even consider reunification and that the parent doesn't have that right. Um, I'm here most importantly for my kids, but in support of this bill because it's not only my family. As you see, there's millions of families affected by this and we need a resolution. Mm -hmm. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Ms. DeClara Tripp, who is still fighting in court. Um, she was found to have never abused her children. Uh, her son has been removed from her care since infancy, and it's been about two years now, I believe. She won her initial TPR, and um, Ramsey County has filed a new TPR against her. Uh, and again, she was found, and it is documented that she never abused her children. In fact, she's caring for uh, three others safely. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Declara Tripp, and I want to share my experience with Ramsey County Child Protection Services, which will speak to why there is, serious, why there is a serious need for implementation of the Minnesota African American Family Preservation Act. 
In September 2015, my youngest child, Zakari Finger, suffered a life-threatening event due to his prematurity and was illegally removed from my care due to improper investigation and fabricated reports made by Ramsey County Child Protection Services. It has since been determined that I nor my children caused any physical abuse or contributed to the injuries Zakari suffered. Minnesota statute dictates that a case plan be created within 30 days and that reasonable efforts be made to prevent the removal of children, and this was not an action taken in my case. At the onset of this case, I was denied kinship placement, and Zakari was then placed in a non-relative, culturally inappropriate placement where he received inadequate care, resulting in a hospital admission being diagnosed with failure to thrive. Zakari was then placed in a relative placement and shortly after removed without cause. Zakari was placed again in a culturally inappropriate placement where multiple reports were made of unexplained injuries. Mm. And these re reports were ignored by Ramsey County um, Child Protection Services. These reports mm. Sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Throughout this process, my parental and constitutional and civil rights have been violated, along with Minnesota statutes for child protection procedures. I have substantially complied to all recommendations with recommendations being biased, unfair, unethical, and irrelevant to the issues that brought my case into court. In July of 2017, I prevailed in a termination of parental rights trial, and it has been nine months, and Ramsey County has failed to reunify me with my youngest child. <clears throat> Ramsey County has entered a new petition to attempt to terminate my parental rights on my youngest child, and I would like everyone to take note that I have a total of four children, and the three have remained in my care for the entirety of this case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to add that uh, the service providers, school personnel, her senator has written letters to the county on her behalf speaking to uh, how excellent of a mother and provider she has been, and that's been ignored. Next, we're going to hear from Senator Hayden, who will wrap it up for us. Thank you, Senator. Um, good to see you guys. For those who don't know me in the press, my name is Jeff Hayden, J-E-F-F-H-A-Y-D-E-N. Being a little facetious, I've been at this uh, microphone over the years. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody uh, who showed up today, and especially uh, those families and advocates. Um, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge some of our elected officials who are standing with us, Representative Hornstein, uh, who had to leave, Representative Clark, uh, who is uh, one of my partners, uh, Representative Fu Lee, Representative Ray Dean, uh, we also have the Council of African Heritage Executive Director Justin Terrell. Uh, we have the President of Minneapolis NAACP Leslie Badu. Um, and then we also have in the crowd here Commissioner, Ramsey County Commissioner Tony Carter, who has uh, led the way around the state uh, on these issues. And it sounds like, Commissioner, you may want to have a conversation uh, with some of our families here. I think that they're going to need your advocacy uh, and help clearly. Um, the Obviously, the reason here is that we care for all children in Minnesota, um, but in particular, we know that American Indian children and African American children are disproportionate in the system. And so we do have a mechanism through uh, tribal sovereignty and the ICWA uh, statutes that really work with American uh, Indian children. We have a lot more work to do there, but there are things in statute that really dictate that. And so this bill really seeks to get that same level of uh, depth and protection uh, for African American children. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what is interesting is beyond the disparate issues that we continue to talk about, what happens is that it is clear that even when African American children enter the system, their treatment inside the system is different. Yes. And I want to, that, that's very nuanced. And so we've had a long, a lot of long conversations about how they're treated, where they're placed, what are the options that are put before the families? Uh, do the families understand all of the options that they have in front of them? Mm -hmm. um, I have dealt with numerous cases in which 
They have gone down this road, and um, I can remember a case that I just dealt with in Hennepin County in which the foster family had multiple children and had had multiple children throughout the last 20 years, and one of the children uh, started to have some significant issues as he reached adolescence mm -hmm. due to his diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome and other mental health issues. That condition made him inappropriate for the household, and as he was removed to get treatment, he ended up in the county home school. Mm -hmm. And so the father, uh, who's a, a local <coughs> pastor, and the uh, and the ability to protect his own family and his foster family and his wife alerted the county that he really didn't think the child was appropriate for that setting. Um, they ultimately charged him with neglect. Mm -hmm. He then uh, became a subject of an investigation. Mm -hmm. The other foster children were removed mm -hmm. and his children who are now foster parents couldn't go to grandpa's house for Thanksgiving because he would then, they would then uh, be, be at risk of those children being taken from them. And so we marched this process through the county and there were all of these issues that happened down the line and people kind of keeping their head down. And those are the kind of things that we hear about all the time. So I wanted to highlight that because of the necessity, because I think that often what happens is people say, why this particular group? Why are we carving it out? Well, it's because they have been treated unfairly. Right. And they've been treated unfairly in a systemic way. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you're just hearing the antidotes yeah. um, of what is here, but every single day, we hear cases of this stuff happening inside of the system that it is essentially a factory and we have to kind of get that to stop. Right. We have to really take a deeper dive and to look at it. We are extremely disingenuous when we say we care about children mm -hmm. and in particular black children mm -hmm. and their educational outcomes mm -hmm. and where they work mm -hmm. and if they're trained and if they're learning, yeah. if we allow these kinds of things to happen. And so I, uh, we are pushing uh, for this bill. We are um, not sure w if we're gonna be able to get it through. This doesn't seem to be a legislature that is uh, really friendly to these issues, but we have uh, continued to push to get a, a advocacy group inside of DHS. You know, I'm gonna take it just a step further and just go a little bit off of the script. Um, the bill calls for uh, a department inside the Department of Human Service in order to look at these issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, if this, if this fall we work hard and my friends in the House uh, uh, take over those chambers and we find a way in the Senate to do it, I'm gonna call for a department that's outside mm -hmm. of the Department of Human Service. Mm -hmm. That looks at these issues. I think that uh, to my good friends at DHS, and by the way, I'm the assistant minority leader and a ranking member on human service um, and have worked on these issues since I've been in the legislature. But it is time for us to move outside of the Department of Human Service mm -hmm. to get an independent group to not only monitor these issues, yes. look at these issues, ensure that when the families uh, have been ripped apart, the one thing that government can do, the most egregious thing that government can do is to take your child away from you. Yes. Right. Right. And so it should be at the highest level, you should have the most proof. Right. If you're going to go in and take somebody's child out, you should be absolutely 100% sure right. that that's the right, that's right thing that's to right. do. Right. That's right. That's right. And so we need to treat that at this highest level. We hear about liberties all day around here, but I don't know any liberty mm -hmm. that you take from me if you take my child away from me, mm -hmm. or as a child has been taken away from these folks. Mm -hmm. So we hope to continue to get some work, uh, incremental at best, uh, on this bill this year, but this is something, and I'll say this broad and widely to everybody, this is an issue that we should be at the utmost highest concern. That's right. And when we go out right. this summer and we have conversations with Minnesotans. I want all of you to ask each and every candidate, each and every person that comes from before you, what are they going to do and yeah. do they support yeah. it? Yeah. And if they don't, right. you shouldn't support them. So, with that being said, uh, guys, I'm glad that folks are here. As you can see, un Un, uh, 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 unlike what you hear uh, in the community, black people are together. Amen. That's right. Right. We're united.
And we're united about our children as it's represented here mm -hmm. um, of different age groups. And we also want to thank our allies. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to thank our allies to be there. But we're going to lead on this issue and we're going to need your help. Right. We're going to need your resources. Mm -hmm. That means money. Uh, we're going to need your ability to get out, but we're going to lead on this issue, and we need uh, your help. So, right. so with that, um, with that, we can open up the questions to any of our families or, or any of us here, if, if you have any. Jeff, let's start with you, since you have the microphone up there. Just give us a, a brief synopsis of what this bill would do. You know, you, you talked about the problems mm -hmm. that the community faces. Mm -hmm. What does this bill actually do? Well, it, um, it first of all will protect and strengthen families by um, by actually having a well. This this bill calls for a department. I want an independent department, but reviews those cases. It sees how that how the child got into out of home placement. If it was an appropriate conversation, if it was an appropriate uh, placement, once you placed the child, did you give it the opportunity to place it with family members or others that can take care of the child? Mm -hmm. uh, have you taken in their culture as part of what you do? Mm -hmm. um, um, we have a dysfunctional ombudsman system, I'll say it out loud, yeah. around this issue. It is not working well, it is not funded appropriately. Mm -hmm. So th those are the folks that are supposed to make sure that things are right. When we put in the resources, are we ensuring that, um, that the children are getting their, their needs met? Um, are we demonizing families? Are we, are we uh, allowing, are we, are we like in the, in the case of, of, of this uh, young, young woman behind me, it appears that we're going after them. They beat the case. They said nothing was wrong. They have their children and they refiled. So the bill stands to review those issues, look at those, and if need be, overturn those, uh, those, 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 those cases. Work closely with the courts. One of the things that we haven't talked about and we get a little weary about here is our court system isn't diverse. Right. You know, we got a few judges we all know, Pam and, and, and others and Bransford and others, but our court system isn't diverse. Yeah. Yeah. Our guardian ad litem system isn't diverse. Yes. So it really seeks to go through that, take a look at those issues, and to make sure that it's right. We are taking African-American children out of their homes, and they aren't doing any better than if they would have stayed. The last thing I think we look at broadly and holistically as we would try to develop, and the bill is a shell, and it's, and it's an evolving kind of document, but there are underlying issues around neglect, and that often means that the family is po. Well, that's how we say it in our community. They're poor. They don't, they don't have the resources, and we're using that as a reason to pull uh, right. young people yeah. out. Yeah. Unfortunately, we saw the Republicans just the other day, and I'll bleed into this just a little bit, want to take 115,000 people off of Medicaid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when families lose their health care, usually their children, their children use their health care and they have, a, they, they have a crisis. That's the reason to take a child out the house is because they have a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get uh, preventative care, right, then you can see where that slide goes. So this is a broader issue, but what the bill speaks to do is to really shine the light on the issue, find the best practices, and create a department that specifically looks at these issues around the state. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, let, me, let me just look, please. So I just wanted to ask, specifically, the bill will require the counties to make active efforts to ensure the families are able to remain in the home and be kept safe and that they receive a case plan as they are supposed to. Mm -hmm. It would also mm -hmm. require that the counties make active efforts to place with relatives that are available. Mm -hmm. uh, it would also um, allow parents, guardian ad litems, and social workers to petition the court for a reinstatement of parental rights, not just the county attorney. Mm -hmm. The county attorney's mm -hmm. relationship with the parent is adversarial in nature. Mm -hmm. So a parent petitioning or requesting, as it was mm -hmm. the case in Starshima Jones's uh, case, asking the, the county attorney to go back and reinstate parental rights after they were the ones that kind of led in um, terminating those rights mm -hmm. is nonsensical. Mm -hmm. right. The uh, act would also work to create an uh, African American Child Welfare Advisory Council mm -hmm. that the Child Welfare Wellbeing Department would report to, the one within DHS, to provide oversight and accountability of child welfare staff. Um, and we have some movement yeah. on that in a, in a way that's not as clear as it should be, but we do have some movement on the Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. Policy deadlines have passed, so what's the path forward for this? So that is problematic. 
we weren't able to get a hearing on the bill in, in either body, which I think is shameful. Mm -hmm. um, so we have been able to attach a portion of the advisory committee onto a bill that is a child protection bill that is moving. Um, so I was able to do that at the end of the deadlines there. It's a far cry from what we need, but it is something that continues to move. So we're not sure. We haven't developed a strategy yet if we're going to offer this on the floor. I'd have to talk to my, uh, my co-conspirator here, Representative Moran. Um, and, but I think you guys should watch the, the, the process. I'm not quite sure that the GOP has set up a way in which we can do that. It appears that things are heading towards uh, finance and then heading towards the um, the the uh, omnibus of all omnibus. That's what I used to call it. The 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 supplemental budget omnibus process that often may pass this and send it to the floor as a report and not the actual bill, which doesn't allow us to add amendments. So that's just a little inside baseball that I'm watching pretty closely. Better. Well, okay. Uh, why has could you say what, what who you are and what news? So what you represent? Who are you? Beg pardon? Oh, we just want to know who you are. And what I'm Betty Ellison Harpole, a retired 34-year successful teacher. Okay. Picture yeah. hangs on the wall at Bethune okay. when Judy Farmer said they didn't know how to read, but they okay. beat Bryn Mark Kennegard. Okay, but, <laughs> All right. okay, but uh, mm -hmm. let me just say this. Why hasn't Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Demons in Mississippi, who came here to get their grandchildren after their mother died, she ne they've never given them to them. They, she said, we're retired. We don't need any of their money. We'd like to take, take the children. The foster mother even changed the youngest child's name. She was named after her grandmother, and she changed it. The, child, the children are still here. She's still trying to get them. She's been up here. We protested at City Hall and all of this years ago, and we still, she still has not gotten them. She's passed all the records. Good, Ms. Harper, Look, that's what let this, me just say this. Did you, but I there want to answer people, your question. I, Did you? Wait, let me just make this statement. There are people who are pimping our children. Yes. yes. They are. To get money so I think I think I think to the point that Ms. Harpo was saying that that is what this bill legislatively from a public policy the issue there is with the courts and certainly with the county and we have to continue to work with them but this bill is to create public policy so those things don't happen. Earlier, the legislature is not friendly to the types of issues that you're addressing here today. Can you just expand on that a little bit and what kinds of changes need to be made to have them more friendly to these issues? Well, I would more specifically say that this version of the legislature and their leaders. So my friends in the GOP have not uh, gravitated to this issue. So I would say that we weren't able to get a hearing, as many hearings we weren't able to get on this issue. Um, it doesn't seem to be um, somewhat of a priority. We had this kind of real dust up uh, when the situation happened to Eric Dean and we aren't here to pit families and children against each other, but there seemed to be a lot of goings on and a lot of task force when Eric Dean and Swift County um, was, met, was mistreated and ultimately died. That's happening to our children um, all the time. And we want to be able to separate the bad actors from hardworking families that really have gotten caught in the system. I'll give you an analogy. Uh, right now we're looking at finding interventions on opioids to keep uh, young folks from going to jail and going to the hospital and much less dying and we're diverting them straight to tr treatment but in the 80s when we had a crack epidemic um, we sent them all to jail. Mm -hmm. Now I'll let you think about what the difference between the two populations were at that time. Um, I'm Minister Toy at Christ Temple Apostolic Church. Now, how hopeful are you for this bill to be passed, seeing how we have been having, we as black people have had our children removed from us since we got here. So for the last 399 years, our children have been taken from us. We don't own anything here in, in, in the United States of America, not even our kids. So how hopeful are you that this Republican Senate or the next 
uh, or this Republican House or this legislative body is going to pass this particular bill when never in the history of America have we been given the opportunity to keep our children if it deems that we don't need them or we don't, they, or no one wants us to have them, the powers that be. Well, I guess what I'd say, and Representative Moran was getting on this too, is that we're here for a reason. And we're here to create public policy. And so there's a lot of things in the 10 years uh, and then eight years of Representative Moran and others have been here that we didn't think was going to happen that did. So we have, we have incremental gains, right, which doesn't always help our, 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 our folks today. But this is the start of really shining the light at the issue. I didn't think we'd have a black mayor in our capital city uh, this year, right? I, <laughs> I didn't think we'd have a black commissioner of the Department of Economic Development. I didn't think we'd have a chief inclusion officer. I didn't think we'd have a black majority or deputy majority leader. So there's a lot that we have to do yet, but there's a lot that we're doing. Um, I didn't think we'd have a functional council of African American heritage, but we do. So we're doing better. Um, and we just have to, it, we, it will absolutely happen. It will absolutely happen, but we're gonna need your help. Yeah. Yeah. So the one thing that we know is that this is not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be simple, it's not gonna be quick. Because those who don't care about our babies are going to be working, doing what they do. And so part of today is say that it's gonna take all of us to create the will. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's about people. You know, we have a governor's race that's coming up you know, every elected official is up in the ballot, and we need to have a present, and we need to make this a priority, and we would be like all of us, mm -hmm. having a part in this. You know, um, that's important. That is really important. So we're here for this press conference to bring the awareness and the injustice that is happening, that is really real for our babies and our families and our communities, right? And we have to be the messenger of that message. And like Senator Hayton said, that you know, who would have thought that you know we would have had a black president for eight years in our lifetime? <laughs> but when people show up, find their voices, and know that we have uh, a part to play in what our future looks like. We can change those outcomes. And so we're, this is a call to action. That is a call to action for all of us because our babies and our families are the foundation of who we are. Yeah. And that is important to us. Okay, we're going to take at least one or two more questions. One from the audience member. I don't know if the press has any more questions that we probably should let folks go. So I hope she was there. We'll, we'll allow you to. Okay. Okay, my name is Leslie Ann um, Crosby. I guess um, I'm here representing Black Coalition. So if our, um, if our children are monetized, which is what it seems like is happening, so our children have been monetized, how do we, do we have a system that is now counting on the, uh, counting on our children to be dividends for them. So there's a, m there must be some type of quota of children that they take a year to meet balances and to make sure that foster children are paid. How do we stop that? Because if we don't, if we don't, un if we don't make our children more valuable to us and in our homes, and we un how do we unmonetize our babies so that the system doesn't look at them as dividends, so that they then come in and take them? Because that seems like what's happening. Yeah, so I, I, you know, what, what I would encourage us to do, first of all, um, everybody should get a copy of the bill and figure out, kind of, and read it, uh, figure it out. But I would also have you look at the, the Governor's Child Welfare Report and the other works that we're doing. So I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't characterize it as monetized directly because I don't think you'll find anything in the, in the policy that says that. However, that is the benefactor. That is ultimately what is happening. So what I would say is we need to become very good stewards of the policy. We need to look at, there are many changes that have happened in the system, North Star and, and the way in which I think the county workers, to their defense, would often tell you that the, what we've asked them to do has put them in a position in which they're going to err on taking children than not. That's something that we have to be able to fix and we have to listen to. So I think to continue to look at this issue, we're going to continue to fight to make sure that we have the great kind of oversight, listen to community members, and then bring that forward. And this will be kind of an evolving uh, document and an evolving opportunity for us to do it. Okay, I, there was a member of the press that might have left. So, oh, in the corner. Yeah, here. I'm just wondering if any one of the, the folks who have personally gone through this, if you just wanted to tell, like, you know, what's this been like on a day-to-day -day basis to have to fight for this and the exhaustion and frustration with that? I know you express a lot of frustration in your opening comments, but just what that's like. What's the day-to-day fight for you to deal with this? 
is very traumatizing, is emotional for me. It is a battle that I know I can't win by myself. Mm -hmm. um, I love all of my children, so to single out one of my children right. and to insinuate that I have a problem parenting with one of them versus all four of them is an issue for me. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what we can do as voters to get involved and support this uh, bill? So I would just say to um, call, find out who your legislator is, both your senator and your house person, to call them. Make sure that they understand and get your friends and your family uh, and your allies to call them. So one is I would say that and tell them that you support this um, and this is going to be helpful in the, your decision on how you support them uh, moving forward is mm -hmm. if they support it. Number two, I would say get involved with the coalition. There's lots of coalition building going on here. I would say to get in contact with you, and I'm not saying that, Tony, because she's just here, but your county commissioners. We have a system that the state oversees it, makes the rules, mandates it, underfunds it, and then gives the county the, uh, to then fund it and then to go out there and do the work that we tell them. We quintessentially call that an unfunded mandate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have to be able to talk to our county folks. They're the ones that are making the decision. And here's the other thing that I think we just don't do because we don't have access. The judicial branch is a really important part of this issue. They're the ultimate decision maker. So counties and the County Commission of Human Service do the work, the county uh, attorney, so Mike Freeman and John Choi, we just know them from the here. They have a very important role in this. The judges have a really important role in this. And your ability to be able to continue to put the pressure on them, these are all elected officials, yes. right? Mike Freeman's up for election. I'm not picking on him this year, but he is. I don't know if John is this year or not. What John is also. This is a conversation that we have to have. I'm not sure that we're having. We have a lot of conversations with county attorneys. I don't hear people talking about this issue. The other issues are important, but I don't know one is more important than their children. Okay, I want to take the last question from here, then I want to press the file. I'm Donna Wade. I wear a lot of hats. But today I'm up here for Black Troops. It's a, a organization to start that I had to start. My son got shot. I've talked to probably a few guys a lot of times. I've been with Welfare Rights Committee. Now, being that I've had to put the two together, I know for a fact that there is no income coming into these houses. I was wondering, um, do you plan on making an exclusion for these families to be reinstated against the federal law to reinstate their cash finances for their family? Uh, I don't think that that's part of the bill. Mm. Well, I don't know if welfare um, is the... Living at zero percent. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying, and, I'm, and I, I understand what you're saying. I'm not saying that that, that mechanism is the mechanism. I'm not saying that, that people go for their 60 months and that's exhausted. The, I'm not sure where we're going to go with that. What I have said is we have spent a tremendous amount of time, effort, and money training people so that they can be self-sufficient, so that they can go out and work and then be able to take care of their families and shed themselves of the tentacles. Families, child services that have been excluded from cash assistance? Well, I don't know how many child protection families have exhausted their 60-month benefits. I don't know. Do you know? Is it a rhetorical question? It's, 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 it's research. It's yours. But one thing that we do know and one thing that we do believe is that probably is not an indicator for taking kids out right. of home. But, but right. Do you know and so we that keep them below the policy rate would be something you should consider, right? Well, let's talk later. Talk to let's, them. Let's talk later. I'm, I'm about your specific issue on, on that issue. But for today, our goal. Today, the goal is let's talk about child on child crimes. Not yeah, no, that's not what we're talking yeah, about. No, what I'm well, listen, so we'll have that child conversation. Protection. Thank you guys for coming. We appreciate it, and then we'll have. We'll have we have a lot of issues that we agree with you. Is the number one reason why this is a well oiled machine. You cause the problem, now you get okay, to come up with the solution. I think that's kind of funny. Why don't you go against the federal law and see how many families help themselves?